Good afternoon, everybody. Happy Tuesday. Uh, as advertised, uh, I'm going to be joined today by uh, Brett McGurk. Uh, Brett has been here uh, a couple of times before. Uh, Brett just left the National Security Council meeting with the President. Uh, the President, as you know, convenes his National Security Council uh, every few weeks to review the progress uh, that uh, we're making against ISIL. Uh, Brett participated in the meeting and is uh, now, to provide, now here to provide an update to all of you uh, on that progress. Uh, Brett's title, I was asking him just before we walked in, is uh, Special Presidential Envoy to the Global Coalition Against ISIL. Uh, he's got a, a presentation that he'll offer up, and then uh, he'll take some questions, he'll leave, and then I can take your questions on non-ISIL-related topics from there. Okay? So with that, Brett, you want to take it away? Sure. Thanks, Josh. So thanks for having me. I thought I would uh, give an update on the counter-ISIL campaign. Last time I was here, I think it was about six months ago, and I have a lot of new information which I'll convey. Uh, the President just convened, as Josh mentioned, his National Security Council today to discuss the current status of the global campaign against ISIL. Uh, the meeting provided an in-depth overview of where we are in this campaign, and I want to provide a, just an update overall. So as you know, we analyze ISIL and focus our policy on destroying it in really three dimensions, its core in Iraq and Syria and shrinking its physical space, its networks, that's foreign fighters, finance, and propaganda media networks, and then its so-called affiliates, and they have about eight of these affiliates around the world, of which Libya has been of particular concern to us. So the United States, we have an integrated campaign plan that incorporates our entire government, defense, state, treasury, justice, homeland security, and the intelligence community around specific lines of effort. It's called the ICP, and it's an effort we review and refresh really each, each quarter to help identify opportunities, reinforce areas where we're having success, and address areas that may have fallen behind. The President received a detailed update on this ICP this morning. We also, of course, lead a global coalition of 68 members. This is one of the largest coalitions of its kind in history to relentlessly combat ISIL across all lines of effort. So militarily, on the ground in Iraq and Syria, we're supporting partners with training, equipping, advising, and airstrikes. About 17,455 airstrikes against ISIL terrorists as of this morning. Through law enforcement cooperation, where we're sharing information to find and disrupt plots around the world. Through intelligence, homeland security, and other channels to help combat the flow of foreign fighters across borders. Through treasury and finance to destroy ISIL's economic infrastructure and through both governments and the private sector to combat ISIL's poisonous ideology and their propaganda online, their ability to recruit. Our global coalition has also provided billions of dollars to support stabilization in areas cleared of ISIL, enabling citizens to return. And this is not only a U.S. effort. ISIL is an enemy that threatens the entire world, so we have leveraged resources from around the world, including more than $2 billion pledged for humanitarian stabilization efforts in Iraq during coalition meetings in July. But U.S. leadership matters on this, and that's why I want to thank the Congress for their close coordination in supporting a counter-ISIL budget amendment in the recently passed continuing resolution. Uh, these funds will be essential to help us accelerate the campaign and support efforts such as demining that allows people to return to their homes. And I'll be calling on coalition partners to make similar contr contributions here over the coming days. Let me update you briefly on some of the update the cam campaigns we have ongoing now, particularly in CERT, Libya, in Raqqa, and Mosul. In CERT, about a year ago, ISIL controlled approximately 150 kilometers of land on the Mediterranean coastline. It was using Libya as a haven from which to plan attacks in neighboring Tunisia, and ISIL leaders were encouraging people to travel to Libya instead of Syria to join ISIL. They saw it as their growing safe haven. Since that time, at the President's direction, we have eliminated the mastermind of the Tunisia attacks, Nur ad-Din Shushain, the leader of ISIL in Libya, Abu Nabil, who came from Syria to lead ISIL in Libya. And now we've just completed operations to liberate certain and surrounding areas. So in Operation Odyssey Lightning, U.S. military forces conducted almost 500 airstrikes in support of units fighting under the authority of Libya's Government of National Accord. And while there's still great work to be done, this strategic location of the Mediterranean is no longer accessible to ISIL terrorists. And we'll, of course, continue to, continue to support the gover government of national court as it pursues ISIL throughout the country. 
in Raqqa. Raqqa remains ISIL's administrative capital, and it is under more pressure now than ever before. Forces partner with our coalition have now entirely severed routes between Raqqa and ISIL locations in Iraq. And the Syrian Democratic Forces, a coalition of local Arabs and Kurds, are steadily advancing on Raqqa with the aim to isolate or really strangulate the city. Since this operation began about one month ago, the SDF has cleared 700 square kilometers north of Raqqa, and just on Saturday, they began a second phase of operations along a new axis just to the west, and this is proceeding quite well. The pressure on Raqqa is bearing fruit as ISIL leaders come out of hiding, which allows us to kill them. Today, we confirm the deaths by precision coalition airstrikes of three terrorist leaders in Raqqa. Salah Gormat, Sami Jidou, D-J-E-D-O-U, and Walid Haman. Gourmat was a French Algerian and Jidou a Belgian. They were responsible for planning and facilitating the November 13th attacks in Paris last year. They were also actively plotting attacks when they were killed on December 4th in the streets of Raqqa. Haman had been convicted by a Belgian court for a terrorist plot in 2015, and he was working with Gourmat and Jidou to plan new attacks. So these three dead terrorists in Raqqa join a growing list from ISIL's what we call their external operations network that we have targeted and eliminated. Last month, coalition forces eliminated Abdul Basit al-Iraqi. He was the ISIL emir for attacks throughout the Middle East, East region and a key facilitator for terrorist travel through Turkey. Coalition strikes also killed Boubacar al-Hakim, an ISIL leader planning attacks in France and throughout Europe. And the leader of all ISIL external operations, of course, Mohammed Anani, was killed on August 30th as he traveled from Raqqa to Ba. So the point is, even as, as operations continue to move towards Raqqa, our coalition is relentlessly reaching into Raqqa to eliminate ISIL leaders with a particular focus on those planning a plotting against our homeland and our partners. For the operation to seize and hold Raqqa, which will be coming, we're in close consultation with our partners, including Turkey. I was in Ankara last week for talks on this and other topics, and these talks were uh, quite fruitful and the President's authorization over the weekend for an additional uh, 200 Special Operations Forces in Syria will help further accelerate our campaign to eject ISIL from Raqqa. I visited these Special Operators several times, and uh, they are doing truly heroic work to protect our homeland and to eliminate this haven of ISIL in Syria. I briefly discuss the Mosul campaign. We're now in month two of what is really the most complex operation to date, the liberation of Mosul. And thus far, we've seen a very steady and deliberate advance along all axes against ISIL terrorists, which are using the civilian population in Mosul as human shields. I just visited the eastern axis just in the outskirts of Mosul last week. As Secretary Carter was in Iraq, and he visited the Qara West Air Base south of Mosul over the weekend, and General Votel, our CENTCOM commander, uh, was in the same area uh, just yesterday and gave a very detail to the President this morning. And all of us witnessed this unprecedented cooperation between the Iraqi security forces and Kurdish Peshmerga, which has really been essential uh, to this campaign. Our coalition, since the beginning of this campaign, about two years ago, we've trained over 65,000 Iraqi personnel who are now fighting professionally and performing heroically. So ISIL terrorists are now trapped in Mosul. They're unable to resupply or replenish their dwindling ranks. Throughout this campaign, which began just a couple months ago now, we've already conducted over 500 airstrikes, uh, destroyed about 100 car bombs, 100 tunnels, 300 bunkers, and this is ongoing every single day. We're often asked, how long is this going to take? And the answer is, in Mosul, it'll take as long as it takes. And I think it's useful to remember other campaigns against ISIL, Kobani, Raqqa, Beji oil refinery, very significant campaigns. Each of them took about six months. Some have gone faster. Fallujah went a little faster than anticipated. And the key thing is that what ISIL does in these cities is they set up concentric rings of defenses, and once you break through the crust of that defense, you don't know what's going to come next. Eventually, they reach a culmination point. They simply cannot resupply. They run out of suicide bombers, and they culminate. And in Mosul, we don't know when that will come. Uh, it could come very soon. It could come a couple months from now. But our momentum will uh, be sustained, and we'll provide, provide and pro uh, a relentless pressure on the enemy throughout Mosul. Every single operation in Iraq that we have supported has succeeded, and all the ground that has been retaken from ISIL in Iraq has been held, and Mosul will be no different. Let me very briefly, in about five minutes, just go through some of the indicators that I discussed last time when I was here in June 
there's about eight of them, but I'll go through them fairly quickly, of how we track this overall campaign and how we measure how we're doing. Uh, the first is territory. And we actually have a new map here, uh, which just came out this morning from our uh, intelligence community. And the map demonstrates that ISIL continues to lose significant ground. And why is this important? Because what has made ISIL this global phenomenon with all of these recruits from all around the world, although that's rapidly diminishing, is this notion of this homeland and caliphate. And all of their propaganda used to talk about this expanding homeland, this expanding movement. And they can no longer say that because their territory is now rapidly shrinking. So in Iraq now, about 61% of territory that had been controlled by ISIL has now been reclaimed. And in Syria, about 28%. But what is most significant, I think the last time I was here, uh, there was still a 98-kilometer strip of border with Turkey in which ISIL terrorists were still able to come in and out. And that is where the Paris attackers, the Brussels attackers, transited through this route. So since then, over the last six months, we've worked very closely with the Syrian Democratic Forces and also with Turkey and the moderate opposition to close off that route. It's at the number one in the map. So ISIL now has no access to an interna international border, and this has significantly impacted the overall campaign because they are now a very uh, isolated entity within Syria and Iraq, and most importantly, it is much harder for them uh, to come in and out, which is critical for them to project their terrorist acts outside of Iraq and Syria. So territory, we're continuing to shrink as we speak, and that'll continue. Leadership, um, ISIL's leadership ranks are dwindling, I already mentioned some of the recent strikes against their leaders in Raqqa. But since the start of the campaign, we've eliminated nearly all of Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi's deputies and his trusted advisors. That includes his likely successor, Haji Imam, his ministers for war, finance, oil and gas, security, and external operations. And as these leaders are replaced, uh, we target and kill the replacements. And we've seen a significant degradation in their overall capabilities and ranks. Baghdadi himself, he claims to be the caliph. Um, he, we have not seen his face in well over a year. He issued an audio tape about a month ago, uh, but issuing audio tapes deep in hiding is not really a sign of a confident leader, particularly in today's media age. So eventually, uh, we will find and eliminate him as well, but the leadership ranks continue to diminish. Third indicator, their overall fighting capacity, their overall strength, overall fighters. The number of battle-ready fighters inside Iraq and Syria is now at its lowest point uh, that it's ever been. Uh, we estimate about 12 to 15,000, and ISIL is unable to replenish its ranks. Whereas we used to see about 1,000 foreign fighters in 2014 timeframe flowing into Syria, coming from all around the world. I've mentioned this before, an unprecedented number of these foreign fighters, these jihadi fighters coming from all around the world, almost 40,000. Uh, it's now down to really what is quite a negligible amount in our estimation. And that's really thanks, again, to the efforts, uh, our efforts on the ground and our special operators have done an incredible job to clear out that area of the border just south of Turkey. And now the uh, intervention from Turkey to, to protect its border, make sure that these terrorists cannot get in and out. Uh, we are also making sure that foreign fighters cannot uh, transit across borders. So about 60 countries within the coalition have really strengthened their laws against uh, the transit of foreign fighters. Plots have been disrupted in about 15 countries, and this continues. One of the unsung efforts of our coalition, which is really strengthened, uh, is the information sharing among different capitals. Uh, this is something that has now really accelerated, and it's uh, increased our ability to stay well ahead of this enemy. Fourth indicator, briefly, is revenue. Uh, we're destroying ISIL's economic base. Just last week, it's only one example, but last week, a coalition, or air coalition, destroyed about 168 ISIL oil tankers, the largest strike of its kind. And we've continued to target their oil and gas infrastructure, their bulk cash storage sites, and their financial facilitators. They cannot pay their fighters. The fighters come thinking they're going to have this uh, lavish lifestyle. That is not happening. Their fighters are not getting paid. And we have uh, multiple indications of that, and we will continue to maintain this relentless pressure. The fifth indicator is one I mentioned. This was really critical when we started this, was their access to borders. Again, they were flowing in and out uh, by the, almost a, over 1,000 a month. That is no longer happening. So quite significant development to close off uh, their entire access to international border. Sixth indicator, media propaganda. ISIL used to have this very slick, sophisticated uh, media information apparatus. And it was led by two people. One was Mohammed Anani, their chief spokesman, and also their head of external operations. And two, a very sophisticated uh, media uh, expert named Dr. Wa'ili. He was kind of the head of 
all those slick uh, videos they used to produce, uh, both of them are no longer around. Um, we also have been working very closely with the private sector and within the coalition to get their content off the internet to make it far harder to access. Uh, their overall output is down by about 75%. If you just measure, we measure these things in 12 month increments from August of 2015 to August this year, decrease of 75%. Twitter, just one example, have taken down 400,000 pro-ISIL Twitter ha handles and the ratio of anti-ISIL information to pro-ISIL information has totally flipped from where it was two years ago, and we'll keep this going. This is also a global effort. So ISIL tries to recruit with different messages around the world. So in the UK, uh, we have the UK leading an effort to really target those who might be recruited in Europe. In the Gulf region, we're working very closely with the UAE. They have the, going to, uh, I met them, um, really incredible young people who are working 24 seven to counter the toxic ideology and poisonous messages of ISIL. Saudi Arabia is helping quite a bit with that. And even in Southeast Asia, uh, Malaysians and other critical partners within our coalition are helping to counter the message in that part of the world. Very different messages in different parts of the world, and we work to adapt to that. Seventh indicator, uh, briefly, is global, what we call global cohesion. ISIL had sought to be a global organization with direct links, financial fighters, leaders, between its core in Iraq and Syria to these so-called affiliates. So in response, we strengthen a global coalition to find and sever all of those links. The result has been a weakening of their so-called affiliates across the board. I mentioned Libya, but also Boko Haram in the Lake Chad Basin and Afghanistan. All of these entities uh, are being significantly degraded. Importantly, our coalition also includes multinational organizations such as Interpol and Europol uh, to help develop a global database of ISIL affiliated fighters to stop again, their transit across borders. My deputy, Lieutenant General Wolf, was at the Interpol annual meeting last month to try to strengthen these relationships and make sure uh, that we are sharing the information we need to stay ahead of this threat. So as ISIL's global cohesion weakens, ours is strengthening with cooperation across the globe. I would just say in conclusion, and I mentioned this last time, uh, we are having tremendous success against this enemy. It is accelerating. We are now putting pressure on its two so-called capitals of, ISIL, of Mosul and Raqqa. Simultaneous, relentless pressure that will continue. We are killing their leaders. We're taking off their ability to finance and resource themselves. But this remains an unprecedented threat. Uh, the fight is not over. This will remain a multi-year effort. But we have developed a campaign that is global, and I hope I've demonstrated the overall breadth of the campaign. Um, I also just want to say, you know, since we've been doing this for a couple of years and I visit our guys in the field all the time, um, we've lost five Americans in this campaign. Five of our military personnel uh, have been killed in this campaign. And I also, it's important to keep in mind, because I saw it with my own eyes, the casualty collection points just outside Mosul of the Iraqis who are fighting. We are advising them to fight and retake their territory, similar to our Syrian partners. And their casualties are very high. Uh, the, an operation in Monbij, Syria, for example, which was really important to protect us. Monbij is where the foreign fighters were flowing through. It's where they were planning external operations. And the Syrian Democratic Forces in that operation had over 1,000 casualties. Similar in Mosul, the Iraqi security forces that we are training, advising, enabling are fighting heroically. They are taking casualties and continuing to advance. And I think we are all very proud to work with them and grateful, and it's also just a reminder of the different mode of operation we have here, enabling, advising local partners to take back the ground that they have lost. And I think it is significant that all the ground we have taken as a coalition, working with locals, everything we've taken back from ISIL, that's over 60% in Iraq, 28% in Syria, none of it ISIL has been able to retake. And that is because before we do any of this, uh, we have a tremendous effort, sometimes months long, sometimes shorter, to prepare the ground politically, economically, to get the stabilization resources in place to help make sure people can return to their homes and make sure that the defeat of ISIL is a lasting one. So it is significant that to date, ISIL has not retaken any of the ground it has lost in operations we have enabled and we're gonna make sure it continues that way. Uh, it's quite a different approach, I will just say, in closing than uh, the Russians. The Russians have really had one counter ISIL uh, mission. They claim to be fighting ISIL. They've had one counter ISIL mission, and that was uh, Palmyra. And they made a big deal out about that. They had a big concert, and they invited uh, members of the media to come see it. And ISIL has now retaken Palmyra. 
In our operations, ISIL has not retaken a speck of ground that we have taken from them. And I think it is fairly significant uh, that the one operation the Russians touted as a counter-ISIL operation, ISIL has now retaken. Now, we're not pleased about that. We want to wipe ISIL entirely off this map. The point of the map, I've, I've, I've explained before, everything that's in color on this map used to be controlled by ISIL. So in the summer of 2014, everything there was part of the caliphate. Everything in green has been retaken, and everything in dark green is just what has been retaken in the last month. Uh, the dark red splotches in the southwest are areas that actually ISIL has gained over the last two years, very small areas and areas that we primarily do not operate. And I'll just say finally on the situation, of course, uh, in Aleppo, uh, this was discussed uh, briefly in the meeting this morning, and there is a very active uh, effort going on to try to resolve this. The Security Council, um, of course, will be uh, convening later today. Uh, but of course, uh, we've said a lot what we think about the tactics. The Russians, the regime, are using uh, tactics that uh, are totally different than anything we do against ISIL in Mosul. We are cognizant of every single innocent life in Mosul. We're fighting an enemy that is using human shields, and we're acting with tremendous precision. And if you see what the Russians are doing uh, with the regime in Aleppo, uh, it could not be any different. So the contracts, I th the contrasts, I think, are quite stark. Uh, with that, I will leave it there. And I think overall, uh, the campaign here against ISIL has momentum. We're always looking for ways to accelerate it, and we're always talking about that. And uh, we will not stop until we destroy this enemy. Thank you, Brett. Let's do some questions. Mark, do you want to start? Sure. Um, can you say how you hand over an operation as complex as this to a new administration? And have you uh, yet briefed any Trump transition personnel? You know, so it's a great question. We were just talking about this. Um, so just in my own experience, I was here in the, I was the senior director for Iraq and Afghanistan in the Bush administration. It was the first transition in wartime in 40 years. And uh, we worked very hard uh, with President Bush and the incoming president-elect President Obama to have a very seamless transition, given the importance of a transition in wartime. So this is similar. A transition in wartime uh, is complex. And the direction very clearly from President Obama is to make sure we're doing all we can to ensure it can be a seamless transition. Uh, there, of course, will be a lot of continuity on the military side. And so uh, we're doing all we possibly can to support that effort. But I'll leave it there. Have you uh, conferred with uh, Trump uh, officials? I think there's, there's constant transition meetings going on, I think, uh, particularly in the State Department. I think those meetings are ongoing now. Have you yet? I won't talk about the individual meetings we're having. Those meetings are ongoing constantly. Okay. Jess? Um, I wanted to ask about two things. First was Libya, and now you outlined a lot of the progress, which in CERC, but the uh, estimates have been that there were between five and 8,000 uh, ISIL fighters there. Obviously, um, they weren't all killed, and so there's, I think, a kind of outstanding question about if those estimates were high, or if not, if they've escaped in a way that they could regroup and, and pose a problem later. And the other question is about um, oil revenues. You talked about that a lot last time we saw you. Um, and I'm wondering if rising oil prices globally could help ISIL in a way that um, sort of counteracts some of the, the gains that you outlined here, or if you feel like they're cut off at this point from the global oil. Yeah, thanks. So two, two very good questions. So in Libya, uh, it's hard to get a precise estimate of how many. I think uh, we think most of them were probably killed in Libya, we think, in, or insert in that campaign. You know, they really hold up. I mentioned this is what they do. This is their defense strategy. They have these kind of rings of defense, and then they have a little citadel in the middle where they try to hold up, hold up and insert. They did that for some months in a little final area of the city. Um, our ambassador, Peter Bode, our ambassador to Libya, is in discussions with uh, Prime Minister Siraj about the next steps in this campaign and what support the Libyans might want. And of course, we'll be discussing that with them. We want to make sure, in our view, that. Uh, ISIL and extremist groups cannot have safe haven or sanctuary anywhere in Libya. Um, on the oil trade, we have significantly reduced their ability to generate any serious revenue from oil. Of course, though, it does continue, but it's all self-generated. I mean, the map, they cannot get any oil out of their little self-contained entity. There is definitely trade going on between different groups. This is a very chaotic situation, particularly in Syria. Uh, but their ability to replenish their resources is just significantly degraded. And whenever we find where they are uh, extracting oil, we make sure that we eliminate that. Olivia, the concern seemed to be, though, that fighters were able to escape, and, and you're discounting that. You'd think that sort of 
our allies were able to sort of fully encapsulate the uh, city. We think we don't get into numbers, but we think we eliminated quite uh, the vast majority of their insert. Um, but if they try to regroup, um, I'm certain we will find a way to deal with that. Mark. Yeah, uh, Rick, the relationship with the Turks, uh, it's been really strained on the diplomatic level, obviously, President, uh, uh, the whole question of uh, cooperation with the coup and the allegations and the request for, uh, 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 you know, the return of uh, the fellow that they think is involved in the coup. Has that been reflected at all in the cooperation you've seen on the, the uh, counter-ISIL campaign? So obviously, it's a complex relation. I was in Ankara about uh, four or five days ago. Had very uh, good, very detailed meetings in Ankara about the overall situation. And you know, the Turks have done an awful lot here over the last year, uh, very close cooperation with us on the counter-ISIL fight. And I felt very good coming out of those meetings about, uh, about the way forward. Uh, General Dunford is in regular contact. The day, the day before I was in Ankara, he was in Interlake meeting his counterpart, uh, General Akar. So, our communications with Turkey is extremely close. Uh, they are doing an operation now just south of that green splotch here uh, near Al Bab. And uh, obviously, we're looking for ways to, to try to help them defeat ISIL in that particularly sensitive area. Um, it's also a sensitive area of the country because you have a number of different forces converging. So a lot of what we do every single day is try to make sure that we de-escalate any tension between non-ISIL affili affiliated forces that we have relationships with. So everybody is focused on the same enemy. This is extremely hard. And that's why I mentioned there, there's another model for doing this. You can send in the 82nd Airborne to go in and do all this kind of stuff. Um, we do not think that that would be a lasting, sustainable way to do it. We think what is sustainable, particularly in something as complex as Syria, is advising, assisting, enabling. And I think the record of what we've been able to clear out uh, has proved that. But it makes it complex because we're trying to encourage our partners that we're working with on the ground you know, you guys need to go that way when sometimes they want to go a different way. So this is what the daily communication and constant discussions are with the Turks and different actors on the ground. But I was very encouraged by my meetings in Ankara last week that we have a, a shared way forward and it's going to continue. They're fighting the, the ISIL forces as much as they want to fight the Kurds. Well, right now they are engaged in a hostile fight against ISIL and um, Turkey, Turkey soldiers have taken casualties, and I think we have to extend our condolences for them. I did that when I was there. Uh, they are engaged in a fight against ISIL on the ground, okay. definitely. Michelle. About a week ago, there were reports in Syria that ISIS leadership, or what's left of it, was meeting to try to pick um, a Baghdadi successor. What do you know about that? Um, do you think al-Baghdadi is wounded or incapacitated in some way? And even if he were taken out of the picture, how much of an effect would that have on their strength? So it's a great question. I saw those reports, which, uh, which we, we can't confirm. I would say any ISIL leaders should have a pretty good secession plan because uh, we're removing them at a pretty fast clip. You know, Baghdadi's unique because he's the guy that rose to the Grand Mosque in Mosul and declared a caliphate, which I think I mentioned this last time I was here, but I've traveled now all around the world to countries in which their young men, and in many cases young women, have been attracted to this movement. And when you say, what is it that's attracted your young people to this movement, there's a, there's a m number of different answers, but there's a common denominator, this notion of a homeland and a, and a caliphate. And Baghdadi claims to have a unique, this phony unique uh, claim to being a caliph. You know, this is all totally a total fraud, but he claims to have this unique lineage that makes him the caliph. So I definitely think that when we do elim eliminate Baghdadi, it'll make a significant difference. I also think it is significant that he tried to be a kind of new type of terrorist leader, giving public speeches, going to the Grand Mosque and giving this sermon in the summer of 2014. And he is now in deep, deep hiding. And we had not heard from him until he issued this audio tape a couple months ago. And it was a very defensive message. It basically said, uh, for all of the fighters in Mosul, stay and fight to the death. Um, but all the indications we're getting is that many did not take that message well, because where is Baghdadi? He is somewhere in hiding. And we also know he hides with, uh, with slaves and all sorts of terrible things. I mean, this guy is one of the most despicable uh, we've ever seen. So we're doing all we can to find and eliminate him. As I mentioned, all of his deputies, nearly all of his deputies have been eliminated, and it's a matter of time before we find him. I do think it'll make a significant difference on ISIL as an organization, as a movement, once he's eliminated, but it'll not eliminate this kind of global jihadi terrorist threat, obviously. Um, given all the progress that 
does, does ISIS still have the ability to plot and, and orchestrate attacks against the United States and our allies from the territory that they have remaining? And will President Obama leave office with that ability apparently still intact? And on Aleppo, you said it was discussed briefly, uh, there are reports that there are scores of civilians being massacred by the advancing Syrian army. Uh, there's also reports of a ceasefire. Did those issues come up, and is there any response to that um, from, from the uh, president? So in terms of plotting, uh, this is what they want to do. ISIL wants to attack us, and they want to attack our partners. And they're very sophisticated, the Paris attacks, the Brussels attacks. Those were planned in Raqqa. They ran through some of these other towns I mentioned, and they would uh, deploy their operatives to carry out attacks. We think we've significantly degrad degraded their ability, ability to do that. But they do have operatives in a number of places in which they are planning external attacks. This is something that is the primary focus of ours, to eliminate what I call that external operations network. So the head of it was Mohammed Anani. That why, that's why targeting him was so significant. Um, most of this is also being done in Raqqa. But I think we have demonstrated these three, the three I mentioned today uh, that were eliminated just a few days ago, uh, were part of this very sophisticated terrorist plotting network. So every single opportunity we get, we are degrading this network. Um, but it still exists. This is still a threat. Uh, they are trying to recruit you know, not plan sophisticated attacks. They're trying to do that, but they're also just trying to recruit deranged individuals from all around the world to act in their name. And uh, that is something that is very hard to stop, which is why the information sharing and everything we're doing kind of behind the scenes as a coalition is so critical. Um, I can't speak to what's happening in Aleppo right now. I will just say, as I think I mentioned at the outset, um, uh, this is a horrific situation. I think it demonstrates once again the tactics that the Russians are using uh, in support of the regime uh, are something that is truly beyond the pale, cannot be any different than the types of tactics that uh, we utilize. And um, I've also seen these reports of the, of the ceasefire and a potential uh, agreement, but I, I can't confirm any of that because this is all fairly late breaking. But I understand the Security Council will be convening uh, later today to discuss it. Andrew. Um, I wanted to follow up on, the, on your trip to Ankara. What did you hear from the Turks? that made you so confident vis-a-vis uh, -vis what they planned in al -Bab and with regards to the YPG? Well, I'll just say this. Uh, Turkey uh, Turkey is, a, is at war against ISIL. There's no question about that. They are fighting on the ground. Uh, they're taking casualties. And ISIL is a significant threat to Turkey. And that is something that uh, they see very clearly. Um, and so we're working through various ways in which we can help them. We do have disagreements, of course, in terms of some things going on in Syria, which we also have very candid discussions about. Um, when it comes to Raqqa, we, we want to get ISIL out of Raqqa as soon as possible. Um, this, but this will be a sequence campaign. That's the only way to do it. So we're in the isolation, kind of the strangulation phase now. And then we have to identify the force to actually move in and seize and hold the city. There are a few options for that. Uh, one of the options, of course, is working very closely with Turkey, and we are having a detailed discussion with them about this. Um, but the most significant thing I, when I was in Turkey was just their threat perception of ISIL as a significant threat to Turkey, which it is. Um, you know, Turkey suffered more casualties in ISIL attacks than almost any of our other coalition partners. And um, so while we've had some disagreements over the years, I thought we had a pretty good uh, shared way forward. Um, not to say there are, isn't some tension, obviously. In the I also wanted to ask, are U.S. forces embedding with the popular mobilization forces? Embedding with popular, yeah, I think you're talking about a report in which there was a photograph of some training of popular, yeah, so popular mobilization forces are uh, known as being the primarily Shia militia forces, many of which operate outside the command and control of the Iraqi government, uh, which is a significant problem, not only to us, but also to the Iraqi government. But under the umbrella of the popular mobilization forces, there are local forces from these areas uh, to hold the ground after operations uh, conclude. Many of these are locals from Nineveh province. So Sunnis, Christians, all sorts of, it's a very uh, diverse province. And I'll give you an example in Anbar province, under the umbrella of the popular mobilization forces, about 15,000 local Anbari tribal fighters mobilized to fight Daesh. That is one reason why, uh, from the four to the five, all of that is green. 
we could not do that only with the Iraqi security forces. We needed the, the tribes to be mobilized. So those are all Sunnis from Ambar. They're being paid by the government to fight ISIL, and uh, we're, of course, supporting them. Richard. Could you tell us a little more about the coalition partners? Uh, are they just as resolute as the U.S. into continuing further? And can you tell us uh, the operation, uh, op operation themselves? Uh, how, what, what's the percentage of the operation being done by the U.S. and the coalition, the percentage by the coalition partners? Besides Turkey, uh, in, in, uh, so again, very good question. I, I've been at this from the beginning of the inception of the coalition. Well, we had about 15 countries, and there was always a question of what will this grow into. Um, in the last three weeks, we had all 68 ambassadors from all 68 members of the State Department, and we also held what's called a kind of the small group of coalition countries, over 20 countries in Berlin just a couple weeks ago. And what is fairly extraordinary about this is the sense of international consensus about the need to basically destroy this enemy and the sense of burden sharing. You know, we, as I mentioned, the United States will not do this alone. We cannot succeed in this alone. And the coalition remains extremely strong. So Secretary Carter will be seeing his counterparts uh, in London here in a few days. And the overall cohesion of the coalition across all these multiple lines of effort, the military gets a lot of the focus, but it is counterfinance, counterpropaganda, um, counter foreign fighters, and everything kind of working together. Uh, we have coordinating mechanisms throughout the coalition. It is working extraordinarily well, and the international consensus behind this effort is something I think uh, we have to continue to build upon because it is something that's quite extraordinary. In terms of overall effort, I mentioned there's been about 17, over 17,000 airstrikes now. Um, I think if you add them up, about 4,500 or so have been coalition airstrikes. So definitely U.S. military forces are doing this the bulk of the airstrikes. There's a reason for that. We have the best military in the world. Um, but the number of coalition partners operating to support that effort is quite significant. And of course, we couldn't do this without flying out of Interlake Air Base, flying out of some other areas within uh, the region. And we're obviously very grateful for that. Without the coalition, uh, we, wouldn't be, we would not be able to, to defeat this enemy. We'll probably have time for two more, and then we're going to let uh, Frank go. Kevin. Thanks, Josh. I just want to sort of follow up, especially as it relates to the coalition and strikes. There's been some reporting, Brett, that the U.S. needed to, to use the Australians to conduct a strike against some of the Paris attackers. And I wonder if you could sort of help me unpack the complications as it relates to the chain of command that the United States might have in conducting airstrikes and having to utilize coalition partners like Australia and others. And second, I wanted to ask you about uh, Saudi Arabia. That story has come out today, and I wondered if you could sort of help unpack this idea that the U.S. is limiting military support for the Saudis because of what's been happening vis-a-vis -vis civilian casualties in Yemen. Um, I can take the Yemen one. Yeah, so let me, I'll just say about the, so, and I, I defer to my DOD colleagues who work this every single day. This has been the most precise air campaign in history. I mean, I think it'll be studied in the future and people will repeat the most precise air campaign in history. And all of our airstrikes go through a comp, a common structure in terms of validating the targets, and it is really moving at an incredible clip. Um, I can't get into the details of sometimes who does a strike and everything. Um, what I will say is when I mentioned today, um, and this was uh, mentioned also by Secretary Carter earlier today, eliminating these external plotters in the streets of Raqqa, uh, painstaking, tireless work by coalition actors, our military forces, our folks on the ground, our intelligence apparatus, all working as one team. And it doesn't always work that way, but it is working it quite, quite well. Um, but I just can't get into in terms of who does what. But um, it is the most precise air campaign in history. Well, we're very proud of it, and that will continue. Um, I'll just say about Saudi Arabia. I was in Saudi Arabia a couple weeks ago to meet with uh, uh, Deputy Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. I've seen him a number of times, uh, including also with Mohammed bin Nayef. And Saudi Arabia also uh, is in this fight. I mean, the ISIL is a fundamental threat to Saudi Arabia. Uh, if you read ISIL's propaganda, if you read what Baghdadi writes, he's obsessed with Saudi Arabia and striking in Saudi Arabia. So we are working very closely with the Saudis in a whole range of areas in order to help uh, degrade ISIL, particularly in a lot of the counter ideological fights. So they're very much in this as well. And I'll let Josh address the, the Yemen question. Okay. Gardner, I'll give you the last one. Um, 
John Brennan has suggested that the campaign on the ground and the campaign against ISIL globally are going in two opposite directions. He said this summer we still have a ways to go before we're able to say that we've made some significant progress. And he warned that the trajectories for this ISIS religious state or caliphate and global violence point in opposite direction. As the pressure mounts on ISIL, he said, we judge that it will intensify its global terror campaign to maintain its dominance of the global terrorism agenda. You're sort of saying the opposite thing. You're saying that these two campaigns are going in exactly the same directions instead of opposite directions. And you're pointing to the three deaths recently of these external plotters as evidence of that. Tell me why there's such a difference between what you're saying and what some other intelligence people in the administration are saying. Why are you so convinced these two things are going together while others say it's sort of like squeezing a balloon, you know, if you squeeze it here, they're going to show up someplace else? Yeah, I don't think it's, it's so much of a disagreement. In fact, we all of our intelligence assessments inform um, the, the way we obviously discuss this and prosecute the campaign. I mean, I said in close, this will be a multi-year effort. Be very clear about that. Um, the number of foreign fighters, the number of people indoctrinated into this ideology is something that will not be overcome for a number of years. And while the notion of the caliphate is what kind of led to this explosive growth of ISIL, that is why shrinking the caliphate is so important. Uh, but there, their desire to inspire attacks around the world as they lose their territory is something that we expect will probably increase. How do they want to stay relevant? They're trying to spark and inspire attacks around the world. That's why they used to say, Muhammad Anani's last statement was very interesting. If you, if you read of Muhammad Anani, the spokesman, all of his propaganda, it, again, it used to be about come to the homeland or retain and expand the caliphate. Most of their propaganda were these sun-drenched scenes of children and families and a very optimistic message, actually. Um, his last message before his death was very different. It actually said, we might lose all of our territory, but, you know, we'll still be around. And in fact, if you can't come, because you can't, because it's hard to get in here now, stay home, pick up a knife, and attack someone down the street. I mean, it's a very different message. It's a message that does not appeal to a broad segment of a population. It's a message that appeals to really deranged individuals. But they are trying to remain relevant as they lose their homeland, what they call their homeland, by trying to inspire these attacks. And that is something that will continue. And that is why one thing we've done in the coalition, uh, we talk about even as we degrade their ability to have territory in Iraq and Syria, we need to adapt as a coalition to increase our ability to share information, our hubs of sharing information, to be able to stay ahead of the threat. So that's something as a coalition that I think will continue for some time. So the military-focused coalition of taking back these cities, which we will do, will evolve into a coalition focused on the information sharing, the patterns of interaction among capitals, among intelligence communities, among law enforcement communities, is something we have to continue to expand upon and grow. That's a much more, that's much less optimistic, even frightening message for those of us in this part of the world, because it's suggesting that your success there only increases the dangers here, no? No, because what, what they can do inside of Iraq and Syria are these big spectacular attacks. Make no mistake, these are terrorists. It's an international terrorist organization that has the same ideology as Osama bin Laden and al-Qaeda. The only difference between ISIL and al-Qaeda is that ISIL said, let's do a caliphate now, whereas al-Qaeda said, well, we'll do a caliphate down the road. I mean, that's the key difference. But they inspire to do massive spectacular attacks around the world. In order to do that, they need territory to plan and plot and resource. And so we're making sure that they are on their heels every single day, but I would never get up here and say this threat is something that is going to go away or something that we cannot remain absolutely vigilant on. And which is why, um, as I mentioned, it's not just DOD and state, it's our entire government working as part of this integrated campaign plan to stay ahead of it, because it's different tools. It's military, law enforcement, intel, and counter messaging. So we need to stay at it every single day and remain vigilant for uh, a long time to come. Thank you, Brett. Okay, thank you. Okay, we can go back to our regular scheduled programming now. Uh, Kevin, do you want to start us? Sure. Josh, I did want to ask about uh, corrupt, 
clear to uh, lay the blame for Palmyra to Russia. Mm -hmm. But now that it has been retaken or partially been retaken, what is the strategy going forward? Um, <coughs> is the U.S. going to be involved in that operation? It, it would seem to be a right target now that you have uh, these forces <coughs> there that we know about. Uh, or are we going to leave that to the Russians to deal with? Well, I, as Brett mentioned, uh, this obviously is uh, something that we're concerned about. I do think that it exposes the failed strategy, or at least calls into question the integrity of those who are describing their strategy. Uh, their strategy, as they state it, is to be focused on ISIL and to be focused on extremists and then terrorists. Uh, but the truth is, the real consequence of their strategy, which appears to be an intense focus on bombing innocent civilians into submission, so that the Assad regime can enjoy some tactical gains actually results in fueling the kind of extremism that we know extremists rely on to thrive. It also is exhibit A when you consider that this is a, an example of Russia taking their eye off the ball when it comes to terrorists that they did have this one limited successful operation against Palmyra, one that the United States was not involved in, but one that we were, um, we were obviously pleased, and we said so at the time, that this was territory that had been taken away from ISIL. Uh, but, you know, ISIL's, but the strategy that Russia has employed has caused them to take their eye off the ball, allow ISIL to make some gains, but it also continues to fuel the kind of extremism that only makes uh, Syria uh, a, a, a haven uh, for terrorist organizations that uh, plot violence not just in the region but around the world. You, um, you had left that uh, particular battle to Russia, and I guess the question now going forward, um, is that strategy going to change? Will the U.S. get involved in, in the fight for this? Uh, well, I, I, yeah, I, I don't have any operational updates uh, uh, at this point, so I can't tell you sort of where this will fall in terms of any uh, planned military operations on the part of our coalition. Uh, but it's, you know, it's obviously a situation that we're watching closely. Um, okay. All right. Aisha. Uh, Iran today uh, ordered uh, its scientists to start developing a, a nuclear-powered marine vessels um, and for what it said uh, as a response to a U.S. violation of the atomic deal. Um, so I, I was wondering, uh, how much of a concern is this, this kind of maybe tit for tat, uh, the idea that Iran is now trying to, saying that it's responding to actions taken by Congress um, by, you know, building these uh, nuclear powered vessels. Is there a concern that this is going to be an ongoing thing and that there's going to be this kind of back and forth now? Well, I, I um I would agree with your assessment that the timing of this announcement to coincide with the President's signing of the Iran Sanctions Act is not likely a coincidence. Um, but we've been clear, even through much of the congressional debate in Congress about the Iran Sanctions Act, that the President would not sign into law a piece of legislation that undermined the international agreement to prevent Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon. The extension of the Iran Sanctions Act does not undermine the international agreement to prevent Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon. Uh, and, you know, we've, uh, that's been our position from the beginning. We've explained that quite clearly in public, and we've explained that in private to the Iranians. Um, at the same time, uh, the announcement from the Iranians today uh, does not run counter to the international agreement to prevent Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon. Um, we continue to be able to watch closely uh, Iran's nuclear program, uh, starting in the, the uranium mills uh, and throughout the nuclear supply chain. That is an unprecedented insight into any country's nuclear program and allows us to verify their ongoing compliance uh, with that program. Uh, and our expectation is that as they undertake uh, these kinds of um, uh, you know, research and development efforts, that they will do so consistent with their international obligations. Uh, and 
and uh, you know, we have uh, the ability, because of the cooperation with the Iranians under the agreement, to verify their ongoing compliance with the agreement. But does this kind of going forward, should this be um, uh, something of a warning to Congress or to the next administration that, you know, that there could be repercussions for pursuing more sanctions or anything like that? Uh, no, I wouldn't uh, be particularly concerned about that. We, there are a, a range of Iranian activities that are a source of concern uh, to the international community and to President Obama outside the scope of the international agreement to prevent Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon. The reason that we pursued that international agreement is because Iran's ability to get access to and potentially use a nuclear weapon was the number one concern of the United States and the international community with regard to Iran. So we've taken that top concern off the table without firing a single shot. And this is something that even the harshest critics of the deal acknowledge has been accomplished. It didn't eliminate all of our concerns with Iran, but it did eliminate our number one concern about Iran. And that's ultimately the point. Uh, there are other concerns that we have about Iran's behavior that include uh, their support for terrorist organizations and other destabilizing elements in the Middle East, like Hezbollah. Uh, we're concerned about the way that Iran continues to menace Israel. And we continue to be concerned about the Iranian regime's lack of respect for basic universal human rights. Uh, and we have uh, a variety of ways of countering all of that activity. Some of that involves additional financial sanctions. Some of that involves close cooperation with our partners in the region. Uh, but um, the number one objective of the international agreement to prevent Iran from obtaining nuclear weapons was to prevent Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon. Uh, and that objective uh, has been achieved. And because of our ability to monitor Iran's nuclear program, we can verify the ongoing success uh, of that effort. And it uh, uh, certainly is something that makes the world a safer place. It enhances the national security of our closest ally in the Middle East, Israel. It enhances the national security of our NATO partners in NATO allies in Europe. And it enhances the national security of uh, the American people. And it will be an important part of uh, President Obama's foreign policy legacy. Okay, Justin. Um, the Energy Department said today that it wasn't going to be turning over names of individual employees um, involved in the President's climate change efforts to um, the transition team, the Trump transition team, and said that the request left employees unsettled. Um, I'm wondering if you could uh, explain if, if that was the only reason that that wasn't made and why this doesn't sort of if it was information that the Trump transition team wanted to violate the president's sort of edict for helping them as much as they can to, to smooth over the transition? Well, we do continue to work closely with the transition team to ensure a smooth and effective transition. And that is work that is going uh, on across a variety of federal agencies, including uh, at the Department of Energy. Uh, but there were reports about what um, certainly could have been in an attempt to target civil servants, career federal government employees. The kinds of people that we're talking about at the Department of Energy are scientists and lawyers and other experts who are critical to the success of the federal government's ability to make policy. And their work transcends the term of any one president. That's by design. That's to ensure the continu continuity of the federal government and to ensure that uh, effective decision making uh, and policy planning uh, is undertaken regardless of which political party is in charge of the Oval Office. If we had to replace the entire Department of Energy uh, every time a, uh, a new president was elected, that is certainly going to undermine uh, the ability of those at the most senior levels to implement a coherent and effective uh, energy policy. You know, our principle and this is a, a principle that presidents in both parties have long abided by, uh, is that we should observe the protections that are in place uh, that ensure that uh, career civil servants are, are evaluated based on merit uh, and not on politics. Uh, and I'm sure that the president-elect used the same kind of criteria 
when choosing his new Department of Energy secretary as well. Um, Don't you think? I'll, yeah. I'll let you uh, interpret that one. But okay. um, the president <laughs> um, mentioned in his Daily Show interview last night that he planned to do some speeches after giving after leaving office and seemed to purposefully delineate those from political speeches that he might give if Donald Trump and his administration did something politically that, that he disagreed with. Um, so assuming that these are paid speeches, and knowing this is something that maybe is on your mind as well, um, I'm wondering if the president's going to be putting any sort of self-imposed restrictions on who, you know, this is a big campaign yeah. issue, Wall Street, um, education, foreign governments, that sort of thing. If, if those sort of things are being set out yeah. already. I, I would anticipate that there will be significant interest in uh, hearing from uh, former President Obama once he's left office. Uh, so he'll have an opportunity to be choosy about which invitations uh, he accepts. Um, and uh, I, don't, I don't have any criteria to lay out for you at this point um, about how he will choose uh, which invitations to accept. Uh, but I'm confident that there will be a, a, a high standard that he'll observe. Okay. Kevin. Thanks. Can I circle back on Yemen? The yes. United States uh, support for the Saudis uh, at least bringing it back, I'm understanding, because in part of the civilian casualties in Yemen. Can you give me sort of an update on, on why that decision was made and what that means moving forward? Yeah, Kevin, we have long expressed some pretty significant concerns about the high rate of civilian casualties uh, in Yemen. And many of those casualties uh, have been as a result of operations carried out by uh, the Saudi-led uh, coalition uh, in the region. Not all of them. Uh, there have also been civilian casualties uh, as a result of operations carried out by uh, their adversaries as well. Uh, but of course, the United States is playing a role uh, in supporting the Saudi-led uh, coalition. And uh, in light of the high rate of civilian casualties, there was the President ordered a review of the kind of assistance that the United States provides uh, to uh, the Saudis as they undertake this effort. Uh, that review is ongoing. Uh, but there are a couple of steps that the United States uh, is prepared to take to, uh, to change some of the assistance that uh, we provide. Um, that includes um, refocusing our efforts uh, to support the Saudis when it comes to enhancing their border security and their territorial integrity. The concerns that the Saudis have expressed, which is entirely legitimate, is that you have a, uh, an organization that has overthrown the government of Yemen and has menaced Saudi Arabia uh, on a number of occasions even breaching uh, their borders. Uh, so uh, Saudi Arabia's concerns about this, I think, are entirely legitimate. Uh, and so we are going to focus our efforts on helping uh, the Saudis um, protect their border. Uh, we also are going to um, undertake steps to refocus our information sharing uh, and the responsibilities of our personnel in Saudi Arabia uh, to be focused on uh, this effort. Um, in addition, um, uh, we've also decided um, to well, I, I think that covers it, and I, and I think this is reflective of the fact that we have these longstanding concerns. This review has been ordered, uh, but, uh, and these are some changes that we've made, but this uh, uh, review is ongoing. Uh, and you know, as this process moves forward, um, you know, I wouldn't rule out uh, additional steps that we may take uh, to address the concerns that have been raised. One more really quickly. A uh, number of electors you were told yesterday were in, uh, requesting an intelligence briefing, and you said you hadn't had a chance to sort of uh, look uh, look over that letter. Have you had a chance to look that over, and what's your reaction to that? Uh, I, I, I've seen some more of the published reports. Yeah. Um, look, it's, uh, you know, when it comes to the Electoral College, we're talking about some of the more um, esoteric aspects of uh, the functioning of our democracy. Um, but it certainly is important that individuals uh, who are entrusted with that responsibility uh, do so with a seriousness of purpose. Um, uh, so, you know, at, at this point, I, I don't have a formal response to the letter to uh, to put forward. Um, but would you support but that idea of having a report sent to electors? 
prior to them casting their votes? Well, I, I, look, I, I know that you know some of the request was for uh, classified information, and it's not clear that all of the um, electors, and I'm sure most of them don't, uh, don't have, have uh, security clearances. So uh, this is an unusual request, uh, maybe even unprecedented. Uh, I'm not a historian, but it's hard to imagine a, a scenario where a similar question uh, arose. Um, so, um, you know, we'll uh, you know we'll let you know if we have more of a response. All right, last one: uh, Is the White House aware of post-election uh, intelligence that actually shows um, anything to do with the hackers' intent? We've talked a bit about that mm -hmm. uh, because of been widely differing assessments. I'm just wondering if the White House remains confident that the intelligence has not, in fact, been politicized. Uh, the president is certainly confident, uh, and he insists. Uh, that the intelligence that he has provided as the Commander-in-Chief by our intelligence agencies is not clouded by political politics um, or partisan politics. Uh, he insists that that material, that that intelligence that he has provided uh, is not clouded by the pursuit of an agenda, uh, a, politi a political agenda or otherwise. Uh, the President can only make good decisions, the Commander-in-Chief, any Commander-in-Chief can only make good decisions when they have information that is accurate, that is timely, and that is reliable. Uh, and that's what the President uh, insists on. And that also means that the President wants to hear the unvarnished truth. He doesn't want anything shaded. He doesn't want uh, any intelligence professional to uh, fear retribution for presenting uh, bad news to the President of the United States. Uh, in some ways, that's actually the basic job description of an intelligence professional who's briefing uh, a principal. Uh, and that is to be able to give an unvarnished assessment and uh, even if it's bad news, uh, without fear of, uh, of any retribution. Uh, and the President has confidence that that's the kind of guidance uh, and uh, information that he's been provided by uh, uh, the intelligence community. The intelligence as to the intent of the hacker. Uh, I don't have any updated uh, uh, assessment to share at this point, uh, but uh, there certainly seem to be uh, a not insignificant number of intelligence professionals who appear to be sharing their opinion with uh, uh, all of you on an, on an anonymous basis. Uh, obviously don't have the luxury of doing that. Um, but you know, when there is a formal assessment to share from the, uh, the intelligence community, um, and if that's something that can be shared publicly, uh, that's something that we'll try to do. The President does believe uh, that we should, particularly when it, when it relates to something as central to our democracy as the conduct of a national election, the President does believe that we should share as much information as possible with the public, and that is why uh, the intelligence community on October 7th, more than a month before the election, uh, issued a statement uh, that represented the unanimous assessment and conclusion of all 17 uh, national security agencies that have an intelligence arm. Uh, and they concluded that uh, Russia was engaged in malicious activity in cyberspace that was aimed at destabilizing our elections. And um, the, you know, we made, the President made clear, we made clear uh, that a proportional response to that was appropriate. Uh, but the President's first concern and the first steps that were undertaken by the U.S. government uh, were to uh, ensure that the uh, equipment uh, and systems that were used to um, register voters, uh, allow voters to cast ballots and to ensure that those ballots were counted, uh, were protected. Uh, and the intelligence community has assessed, and this is something that they've also said publicly, uh, that they did not observe an increase in malicious cyber activity from the Russians on Election Day uh, that could have disrupted the uh, casting and accurate counting of ballots. Uh, um, but uh, uh, for a more detailed assessment about uh, what Russia's motives are uh, or what else Russia may have been engaged in in the context of the election, uh, are a series of questions that will be considered in this review that President Obama has ordered. Uh, our expectation is that this is a review from the uh, intelligence community uh, that will be completed in advance of January 20th, and we're going to make, uh, make public as much of that review as possible. Okay. Michelle. Uh, we heard the President talk a little bit about the hacks since um, he announced the review last night. And, you know, he said that it was nothing fancy, um, that we saw, you know, it's been happening coming from Russia. 
um, you know, seeming to put it into a bigger perspective. And he, he also talked about how he felt that the emails were the things that became the obsession, not the fact that this was coming from Russia, even though he just said that was really nothing new in the same breath. But it seems like what we should be identifying there is the poor state of cybersecurity in this country. The fact that we're even sitting here talking about this being a possibility um, and the, the strong possibility that the election could have been influenced by this, doesn't that really point to the fact that our defenses, whether they're government systems or campaign systems, um, the strength of them pales in comparison to the ability of a state actor like Russia to affect things here? Well, let me start by uh, acknowledging at least one aspect of your premise that I think we could agree on, which is that cybersecurity should be and is a critical national security priority of the United States. And President Obama has spent a significant portion of his presidency trying to strengthen the defenses of the United States. And we've made important progress in doing so. Uh, some of his proposals for doing so, increasing our investments in cybersecurity, have unfortunately fallen on deaf ears in Congress. And you'll recall that there is a substantial increase that was included in the President's budget for cybersecurity that Republicans in Congress refused to even consider. They wouldn't even hold a hearing. This was the first time in 40 years that Republicans in the Congress wouldn't even hold a hearing on the President's budget. Uh, and there wasn't the kind of robust consideration in Congress, let alone a vote on the substantial increase in cybersecurity resources that President Obama had identified. So um, when it comes to ensuring that uh, the U.S. government is focused on cybersecurity, uh, that is a message that uh, apparently has not been received by Republicans in Congress. And yes, that makes the United States of America more vulnerable to a wide range of threats. And that is something that the President continues to be deeply concerned about. Uh, the other thing that the President has done is ordered this review by a bipartisan blue ribbon panel uh, to help the incoming administration formulate uh, and take additional steps to implement uh, an enhanced cybersecurity strategy. Uh, and that's a report that the President received just last week. Uh, and that's one that we'll be passing on to the next administration and should position them uh, for success. Uh, but it's going to require the Republican White House being more persuasive with Republicans in Congress to actually pay attention to this issue because. Uh, there's been a tendency on the part of Republicans in Congress to uh, ignore or reject uh, every proposal that we've put forward, even when it comes to something as apolitical and central to our national security as cybersecurity. So th that all being said, I don't think anybody envisions a scenario in which the federal government of the United States steps in to assume responsibility for the cybersecurity of a national political party or of an individual political operative. I don't think there's anybody that thinks that that would be um, appropriate uh, or even effective. Um, is this a lesson for all of us to try to be more conscientious uh, about our cyber hygiene? Yes. Uh, but state actors have substantial capabilities. Russia has substantial capabilities. They're not as significant as the capabilities that are wielded by the United States, uh, but they are substantial. And establishing rules for the road, rules of the road for uh, effective and acceptable conduct in cyberspace uh, is, a, is an important challenge and one that uh, uh, we've made some progress on. Uh, for example, uh, the President last fall, a little over a year ago now, worked with the Chinese to reach an agreement uh, about uh, at least one norm that should be observed, uh, which is that uh, state actors should not be engaged in cyber-enabled theft for com per commercial purposes or for a commercial benefit. Uh, that had been a previous activity on the part of the Chinese government that had attracted significant concerns not just by the U.S. government, but also by U.S. businesses, I think for obvious reasons. Uh, and uh, that is one norm that we have um, uh, made a lot of progress in establishing in cyberspace. But 
we clearly have more work to do, but I don't think there's anybody uh, who thinks that the answer to this situation is for the federal government of the United States to be responsible for the cybersecurity of the Democratic and Republican parties. Right, but by the same token, it seems like we're seeing that um, the weakness of individuals' email systems collectively in the sense that a foreign state could come in and try or succeed in affecting an election it is almost a, a threat to national security, or at least a threat to the functioning of democracy in this country. So ha has the weakest no. link kind of been, uh, kind of become an individual's email account? No, I don't, I don't think so, because I don't, I don't think that's the, what the president has identified. Um, This is, a, this is going to be a challenge for our democracy. As the American people consume information in the modern age, the fact that this information that was leaked from a variety of places, including John Podesta's Gmail account, That was the source of intense media interest, primarily because of the gossip that may or may not be contained in those emails, not because of the fact that Russia was releasing that information as a transparent effort to, at a minimum, erode confidence in our democracy. And I think that there are obvious questions about cybersecurity that I covered in, in response to your first question, I think what the president is raising is the need for careful evaluation about our public debate, about the way that these views are communicated, or the way this news is communicated, uh, and the way that it is consumed by people all across the country. Uh, and if we lose the ability as a democracy to acknowledge generally accepted facts, basic facts, or if we lose the ability, or at least norms are eroded, such that you have Republicans cheering for Russians to hack their political opponents. And what's troubling about this situation is it wasn't just any old Republican who was doing that. It was the Republican nominee for president who was doing that. That's problematic. That doesn't have anything to do with cybersecurity. It has something to do uh, very basically, though, with the kind of political debate and political discourse and democracy that we want to have. Um, and we're hearing some pushback, strong pushback today from some Democrats on the president-elect's picks for Secretary of State and Deputy Secretary of State, um, ties to Russia, uh, deals with Russia views on sanctions, among other things. Do, do you have anything to add, um, even in a general sense, on those choices? I, I think what I would say generally is that uh, throughout his campaign, the president-elect indicated his intent, if elected president, to pursue warmer relations with Russia. So what better way to do that than to choose somebody who's been awarded the order of friendship by Vladimir Putin to be your secretary of state? So this is not a particularly surprising or even unexpected development. I suspect that there will be many members of Congress in both parties that have some questions about that. I've previously stated the principle that President Obama believes that any president should have some latitude in assembling his team, but there is a a process for members of the Senate to uh, consider the nomination of uh, people who uh, will serve in the, in the cabinet. And look, Mr. Tillerson is a, a seasoned business executive, and um, he's got some skills in answering tough questions in public, uh, and I suspect he'll have to put them to use in the spring. Okay? Uh, Chris, go ahead. Thanks. Um, it was only until President Obama signed an executive order in 2014, barring federal contractors from discriminating against federal workers, that ExxonMobil adopted a policy that uh, to prohibit discrimination against their employees who are gay, lesbian, bisexual, or transgender. Uh, given and the shareholders of that company prior to that 
annual meetings that rejected such a policy uh, 17 consecutive times. Given the uh, practices at, at the company, uh, does the does that raise concerns about, first of all, whether the president's uh, adaption of LGBT human rights as part of foreign policy will be in jeopardy in the next administration, as well as the non-discrimination policy that he's put in place for, for, for federal contractors? Well, l let, me start, let me start by making an observation, Chris, which is that you know, there, we have often talked about how um, disappointed we've been that uh, at various stages Congress has uh, not made progress uh, on a range of issues that the President has prioritized, including uh, ensuring uh, that we treat uh, LGBT Americans fairly uh, and not discriminate against them. And you know, we haven't seen as much legislation passed by Congress as we would like to see that would ensure that those protections are in place. Uh, so the President has turned to using uh, the executive powers at his disposal to try to advance those policies. And we've acknowledged at every turn that those executive actions are not a substitute uh, for legislative action. And there's been the skepticism expressed by some, most of them Democrats, who say that, well, an, uh, uh, an executive action uh, isn't as uh, forceful uh, or as broad uh, as legislation. They're right about that, of course. Uh, but you've highlighted actually a good example where the president taking executive action hasn't just had an impact uh, in, uh, uh, in the government, uh, but it's also uh, had an impact uh, in the private sector as well. Uh, so uh, I think this is, a, uh, this is just one example of uh, how the President's judicious use of executive authority uh, has been effective uh, in changing uh, minds and practices, not just inside the federal government, but in the private sector as well. Um, more broadly, uh, I think it's hard to tell uh, exactly what this particular personnel announcement says about the kinds of policies that President Trump will pursue once he's in office uh, with regard to uh, ensuring that Americans are not discriminated against because of uh, their sexuality. Um, and, you know, I, I think, uh, to put it generously, we've gotten some mixed signals publicly about uh, what the President-elect's intent is. Um, so, uh, you know, on, as with so many other issues that are important, uh, we'll have to s wait and see what uh, policy he intends to pursue. Okay. Ellen. Um, my question is, how, how is the President planning on integrating the fact that, into the security report, the fact that Julian Assange from WikiLeaks and the former British ambassador to Uzbekistan says it wasn't Rush at all, that they met with the person that leaked this, it was an inside job, et cetera. Yeah. Well, that, uh, uh, I've not seen reports citing the British ambassador to uh, Uzbekistan, so I uh, compliment you on the breadth of your uh, reading. Um, what I will just say is, uh, The view that Russia was actively involved in cyber activity that was aimed at eroding public confidence in our political system is the unanimous high confidence conclusion of all 17 intelligence agencies in the United States. That is not a recently known fact. That is not a recently disclosed conclusion. That is a conclusion and a finding and an assessment that was released a month before the election. Uh, so, you know, I know that the president-elect himself has raised doubts about that assessment. Apparently, the British ambassador to Uzbekistan uh, has uh, made common cause with the president-elect uh, to raise those doubts. Uh, but um, the American people will have to judge for themselves whether they have more confidence in the ability of the United States intelligence community to unanimously reach the same conclusion on this matter, or if they trust the um, conclusion of the uh, British ambassador to Uzbekistan. You, Maggie. So going back, back to the Department of Energy, is this the first time that the administration has flat out denied a request made by the Trump transition team? In terms of yeah. Uh, uh, look, I, I think it's an entirely legitimate question. I, I don't think I can get into all of the 
uh, you know, all of the conversations that are taking place at federal agencies all across this town and all across the country to ensure a smooth and effective transition. Uh, I can tell you that in general, the administration has worked hard to diligently provide uh, as much information as possible uh, to, the, uh, to the incoming team. Uh, and that is not the kind of work that you can do just at a moment's notice. Uh, this is a lot of work that requires months and months of planning. Uh, and this administration has been planning since the beginning of the year uh, to compile and prepare materials uh, for the review of the incoming administration. And I, uh, obviously, we envisioned uh, a different kind of process and a different kind of transition. Uh, but um, we remain uh, no less committed to ensuring that the incoming administration can hit the ground running. Uh, and that means providing extensive information um, uh, to the incoming administration. And uh, that, uh, that effort will continue uh, through, election, or through uh, Inauguration Day. Since you brought it up earlier, care to elaborate on your thoughts on uh, President-elect's pick for Energy Secretary? Uh, I think I've said enough about that. <laughs> All right, Andrew. Ask what the president's thoughts are today on regarding Aleppo um, and what this, the fall of the city means for his legacy. Yeah, uh, listen, Andrew. The, uh, you know, as uh, as Brett alluded to, uh, the uh, situation in Aleppo remains deeply troubling, and the innocent loss of life there that has persisted for years at the hands of the Assad regime, uh, enabled by the Russians and Iranians, uh, is deplorable. And. The United States has played a leading role in the international community to try to facilitate a diplomatic resolution uh, to the situation there, at least to just try to reduce the violence and increase the consistent flow of humanitarian relief. Uh, and um, you know, I, I understand that at, at some point later today, and maybe even right now, the United Nations Security Council is meeting to consider uh, such a proposal. Uh, obviously, the, this is... Um, you know, if this ends up being a proposal that will result in uh, a reduction in the violence and an increase in the provision of humanitarian assistance, then it's something that the United States will uh, not just enthusiastically support, but we're going to be uh, actively encouraging uh, all parties to support it and actively encouraging all sides to implement it effectively so that uh, the people in Aleppo who have been suffering in unthinkable circumstances can finally get some measure of relief. Talk about the Syrian and the Russians and the Iranians and what they've done, but a lot of the anger over what's happened in Aleppo is directed at this White House and this presidency. Um, do you think that's fair? Why, why do you think that is? Well, uh, first of all, I, I think I, um, I'm, I'm going to refrain from criticizing people who are having a, an emotional reaction to uh, the terrible violence that they faced. And they're their feelings of anger and frustration, I think, are entirely understandable given what they've been through. And I think it would be uh, inappropriate, maybe even immoral, for me to stand here and criticize them. Um, what I will say uh, is something that you've heard me say before, which is that President Obama has and Secretary Kerry have been at the leading edge of a tireless effort to try to bring that violence to an end, or at least reduce it enough that humanitarian assistance can get to those people that need it the most. Uh, and, uh, and this administration and this president certainly makes no apologies for that tenacious pursuit of uh, the kind of solution that would bring relief to the uh, suffering people of Aleppo. Uh, and it's not particularly surprising to me, given this long-running bloody conflict, that the people of Aleppo are angry that this hasn't been uh, solved more quickly. Looking more broadly to the, to the rest of the world, I mean, I guess the question is, why, why do you think that U.S. military action in Iraq can bring out millions of people onto the streets around the world? But Russian and Iranian actions in Aleppo don't have the same response. Well, I, I um, look. I, I think it's hard to. Um, I think it's hard to paint with a, a broad brush about how the international community is responding to 
uh, this situation. Um, I, I think that you have seen many moral consciences aroused by the violence in this part of the world. And that shows its uh, that shows itself in a variety of ways. Uh, sometimes it is uh, the photograph of a small boy in the back of an ambulance who's barely escaped a Syrian government bomb. There was a pronounced public reaction to that photograph. Uh, these kinds of images do tug at the conscience of people around the world. Uh, it certainly tugs at the conscience of everybody uh, in the Obama administration, and that's why the Obama administration has pursued so tirelessly the kind of diplomatic solution that um, would bring that violence to an end. And that's what we're, that's what we're seeking, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to make some more progress on that at the UN Security Council today. Okay. Yes, ma'am, I'll give you the last one. Hi, Rosalyn Jordan with Al Jazeera, following up on his point on Aleppo. Yeah. Nice um, to see you, Rosalyn. Hi, nice to see you. Um, the civil war in Syria has been going on for almost six years. It has. The estimates between the UN and various human rights groups is that at least 400,000 to 470,000 Syrians have been killed. At least 32,000 of those people have been killed in Aleppo. Some of those people have been on social media. They've been able to go on TV today. They fear they are living the last days or hours of their lives, and they are asking, where is the world in particular? Where is the United States? Mm -hmm. And the question is, and I understand that the president did not want to launch a regional war, but if ever there were an argument, say human rights advocates, to act on responsibility to protect, Syria is that situation. Why did not the administration intervene militarily in the Syrian civil war? Rosalind, the, the answer is simple, and it's one that we've said on a number of occasions. There's no military solution to the civil war in Syria. But how many the, more people have to die? But Rosalind, what is the military proposal that has been tabled that would effectively prevent those deaths? Is the suggestion that somehow the United States should just occupy the nation of Syria? Do we really think that's going to reduce the violence in Syria? I don't think there's any evidence to substantiate that claim, even if that's uh, one that is, uh, is being made. I haven't heard any other sort of suggestion. The only solution is a diplomatic one. And no country in the world has expended more of an effort to pursue that diplomatic solution than the United States of America. The United States has a special responsibility because we have the most influential, strongest country in the world. And we readily accept the responsibility. Certainly under President Obama's leadership, we've readily accepted responsibility for working through the international community and using that influence to try to bring that violence to an end. The United States is the largest bilateral donor of humanitarian assistance. We've provided substantial resources to try to meet the basic humanitarian needs of Syrians who are fleeing violence. And there has been a substantial uh, uh, U.S. military commitment to organizing the international community to try to uh, address some of the consequences of the chaos in Syria, and that is the extremism uh, that has fueled so much terrorism uh, in, in that region of the world. But when it comes to addressing and solving the underlying violence and chaos, that is ultimately a political question and a political solution that's needed. It's the failed political leadership of Bashar al-Assad that has brought us to this point. Uh, and it's resolving that political problem that will be necessary to definitively end the violence uh, and ensure that the people of Aleppo, who've been under siege for years, can get some relief. But if the question has to be raised, given how often Secretary Kerry has personally lobbied the Russian government has personally lobbied the Foreign Minister, Mr. Lavrov, as recently as this weekend, and yet, oh, this isn't the right time to have a ceasefire. The United States is simply protecting the rebels who are holed up in Aleppo. At some point, shouldn't this administration be calling Moscow's bluff and actually forcing them to do what they have promised to do, which is to call back the Syrian military and prevent them from committing what some are now alleging are human rights violations. 
Well, I, I, as we've indicated before, the United States strongly supports and would support uh, an effort to ensure that the Assad regime uh, and uh, those who are culpable for the Assad regime's actions accountable for the tactics that have been used inside of Syria. Far too many innocent lives have been lost. Women and children included. And we believe in, 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 some, account, in some accountability. Uh, and uh, uh, hopefully that is something that the next administration will, um, will continue. But when it comes to Russia, they've spent significant amounts of credibility in trying to describe to the international community their response to this situation. Uh, and you know, as we discussed earlier, as Brett referenced, uh, the Russians regularly like to say that they are focused on taking ISIL fighters off the battlefield in Syria. Uh, but the truth is they've taken their eye off that ball. And the one measurable gain that they'd previously been able to point to against ISIL uh, has now been rolled back. Uh, so I, I think it is very difficult, not just to justify, uh, but even to explain what sort of strategy Russia is trying to pursue inside of Syria. Well, maybe I should say it this way. It's hard to reconcile their explanations about what they're doing inside of Syria with the truth. The truth of the matter is they're focused on propping up the Assad regime, and the Assad regime is trying to bomb civilians into submission so that he can try to get control over his country again. He's lost control over his country. He's lost legitimacy to lead. And the concern from the United States isn't just about the humanitarian situation there. It's about how that chaos has fueled extremism and given life to terrorist organizations that threaten the United States and our interests around the world. So this is a complicated problem, but we're attacking it from every angle. And you heard from Brett the efforts uh, that we're undertaking and that are making significant progress against ISIL. Uh, but the, the role for diplomacy and the leading role that the United States has played in pursuing that diplomacy to address the political situation in Syria uh, is something that we've been pursuing for years and continues to this day. Is this administration considering, in its final weeks, any punitive actions against Vladimir Putin's government because of its ongoing support, militarily, financial, diplomatic, for Bashar al-Assad's government? Well, there are a, a range of steps that we have, uh, uh, have been considering. And the truth is, because of some of uh, Russia's actions in Ukraine, violating the territorial integrity of that country, they're already facing significant isolation uh, that has eroded their status diplomatically uh, and has hurt their economy. Uh, and uh, that, um, uh, so Russia is already suffering the consequences of the kind of international behavior that has been repudiated by the international community. Um, but uh, I wouldn't rule out uh, potentially applying uh, additional steps because of uh, the way that they have uh, behaved in Syria as well. Okay. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow.